The ability to shape the earth around us has been a fundamental aspect of human development throughout our history. Mounds, henges, hill forts and barrows have been in use since the late Stone Age and earthworking techniques like them are still in use today as nearly every modern structure requires the removal of topsoil and levelling and packing down of earth. Suffice it to say, moving earth is uh, undeniably a majorly useful skill for very much of human history. Yet in D&D, there is a single cantrip which lets you do this for free faster than a mid-sized modern excavator. There has to be a catch. Mold Earth in the 5th edition of D&D allows the caster to target an area of dirt or stone within 30 feet, instantaneously changing it in a number of ways as an action. You can use the targeted area as a canvas, colouring or patterning it with any image or message of your choosing for one hour. You can cause the dirt or stone to become difficult terrain for one hour or revert any pre-existing difficult terrain. And lastly, if you target an area of loose earth, you can instantaneously excavate it, move it along the ground and deposit it up to five feet away. But with too little force to damage anyone, one of these effects is clearly not like the others. So we'll start with the weaker effects and make sure you stick around for the best possible uses of mold earth. Firstly, the ability to color, pattern or write on stone or dirt. This can be surprisingly useful. Instead of painstakingly transferring guideline sketches to a wall or ceiling, an artist can now transfer their work onto a subject wholesale with magical precision for an hour. First, to ensure that it fits and looks exactly right suits its framing, and second, as a sort of projection tool to be more accurate in recreating the drawing at large scale, uh, providing guidelines for the whole artistic process. This makes blocking for paintings incredibly easy as long as those paintings are on stone and there is an artistic historic tradition of painting directly on stone, especially on slate. We might even see stone painting overtake canvas painting for this simple ease of expression. And engravings and relief sculptures may be significantly easier with magical guidelines too. The engraver can now shift his design around, changing lettering and spacing to make sure it's just right before he ever puts chisel to rock, reducing the risk of wasted or useless materials when they make a mistake. This could also be an excellent tool for sculptors to be able to find the visual within the stone that they're using before having to actually chisel things out and make a grand mistake. In addition, for quick plans and messages that need to leave absolutely no evidence, there's little better than magic. Summoning complex schematics in the dirt around you can be incredibly useful in a pinch, especially because you can actually interact with the drawn schematics on the dirt by you know, picking up a stick and adding to the drawing. This makes Mold Earth more useful than Minor Illusion for planning heists and battle plans in general, except if they're in a three-dimensional plane, potentially. Not least because your canvas with Mold Earth is up to 30 feet in scale. You can get really quite granular with some of the details that isn't possible in a handheld minor illusion. Regarding the ability of Mold Earth to make or unmake difficult terrain, this is significantly more niche. It's potentially useful in a dungeon corridor made of dirt or stone uh, to buy you some extra time if you're being pursued. Maybe buys you one more turn, maybe more if your pursuers are slower than you, at which point you can just run, why, why bother casting the spell? But the best use I can find in this is to make walls and slopes even more difficult to scale. If your enemy's already climbing at half speed, then halving their speed again gives 
you ample, ample time to prepare defences and potentially aim your bucket of boiling pitch slightly better. Of course, in most military contexts, castle walls are going to be assaulted mostly by siege weapons and ladders, not necessarily climbing up the walls themselves, especially if flying creatures are involved, depending on how exotic an army uh, can be in terms of species diversity. But for defending a wizard's tower from creatures like Grung or apes, making climbing significantly harder and slower for these individuals is a reasonable defensive tool, especially when it can affect an entire 30-foot area. Unfortunately, this effect is, is very unlikely to be useful on a larger scale, as if you are a spellcaster within 30 feet of someone You've generally made a mistake, and you might have far better, more effective tools to slow people down or literally paralyze them. Potentially, if we have mounted knights having access to maybe a cantrip or two, not being full casters, then this could be used to slow down an enemy charge just enough to break the formation, or slow down an enemy retreat just enough to catch up, or indeed break that formation again. It's a niche tool and it still requires you to be within 30 feet of your enemy so you're probably better using your action just to charge in and attack. These are niche applications not worth building entire social practices around. So to the big deal of this cantrip, five cubic feet of earth moved in less than six seconds. This is insane to put it mildly. Now spell text specifies loose earth and it also indicates that it cannot affect stone, which is quite helpful for balance, but still a little overpowered. But this loose earth wording appears nowhere else in the spell and is not defined anywhere, so we don't really have a clear consensus as to what it means. Jeremy Crawford, lead rules designer for the fifth edition of D&D, has uh, previously infamously stated that when it comes to this particular wording, think dirt, not stone. In my view, this is a singularly unhelpful piece of advice and actually creates a huge power imbalance between this cantrip and every other cantrip in the game. If we allow it to move all dirt, because dirt as defined by the mold earth spell is a very loose category indeed. In this interpretation you're basically just playing Minecraft without a pickaxe, punching dirt blocks and just shifting them whenever you want, huge five by five foot squares of earth elevated and shifted just to the side. If we take this to mean soil or dirt generally, then we could see castles of packed earth, some really, really strong, sturdy, difficult to break stuff being formed within just a day by a single caster with a single cantrip. And there would be literally no need for the shovel to be invented at all in such a world. Townsfolk would study everything they possibly could with regards to magic in the hopes of being one of the chosen few who can cast this particular spell. It entirely negates the need for shovels and even plows to exist at all. A single cast of this spell can instantly till any ground, overgrown or not, within 30 feet, in less than six seconds. This is so above and beyond what even modern tools can reasonably do in this time frame that it is absolutely world shattering if we take this to mean any amount of dirt. And remember, dirt includes packed dirt, which is an incredibly strong and sturdy material. It's what many houses in the world are built upon. And it's difficult to move to get into. Heck, plants can barely even grow in properly packed down earth. Some of you may already know what I'm angling for. Forget this particular piece of sage advice and focus on the text of the spell. The spell specifies that this most game-changing of effects must be used on, quote, loose earth. In my worlds and my games, this is a really important limiting factor that dictates the do's and don'ts, cans and can'ts of the entire spell. One, 
Loose Earth indicates that the Earth is not held in place by some other external acting object. This seems obvious, but when we consider that root systems of plants are extensive and can be one of the main reasons why soil actually sticks together, it stands to reason that any soil that contains significant plant roots to hold it together can't be affected by this spell. And two, packed dirt is a very different beast to dirt, mud, and even topsoil. The latter three are movable pretty much by hand if you've got the patience. The last one, if you try and move packed uh, dirt with your hand, you're going to break your hand. Or break fingernails or a collection of things before you make any impact in a five foot cube of packed dirt. Loose earth in my games and my mind refers to the more malleable types of earth, including sand and potentially gravel. But once it's been compacted, that in my book is far beyond the spell's capabilities. So what does all this mean? Are our dreams of 10 minute fortresses dashed? Not even. With the right methods and engineering, Mold Earth still holds insane potential. Firstly, there are some relatively easy ways to loosen hardened dirt. Soak it, turning it to mud use a shovel to break it and any of the plant matter within it up enough, or till it, usually after wetting it. With a few physical labourers and access to water, it is still an incredibly potent spell. One scenario is for developing roadways. Proper, well-maintained roads are critical for logistics, especially in worlds where the wilderness is so very dangerous. Roads need to be reliably direct, have proper drainage, and be made of a hard-wearing material. Imagine, if you will, a team of labourers dedicated to loosening the topsoil of a proposed road route. Some will be tasked with digging deeper across the edges to create ditches on each side for drainage. Every 10 feet or so, a cantrip caster takes all of this slightly loosened dirt and forms a section of road scraping the topsoil away, leaving a raised centre and drainage ditches on the side. The road's peak even is slightly elevated to create a camber with some of the loose dirt. Then if we're feeling really fancy, this kind of reasonably fast progress would be followed by a rolling cart, uh, probably with a rolling wheel on the bottom of it, why not, uh, filled with slabs, which follows our construction team, carrying these slabs to be lain on in a proper Roman style road while also serving as something of a compactor or roller to tamp down the loosened ground again. And this is all you need if you want a permanent, well-maintained road through an incredibly difficult landscape, perhaps even choked with jungle or vines. In swampier or coastal regions, a single mage can literally raise a road by themselves from the mud around them creating a raised central section, passing above the water with relative ease, perhaps even doing it at walking pace. This may not last forever, but in a hot enough or cold enough climate, the road may bake or freeze itself into semi-permanency. This is all without mentioning the incredible ability of mold earth when it comes to uh, graves. A freshly dug grave is instantly excavatable with just this cantrip, making, uh, unfortunately, grave robbing incredibly, incredibly easy in Dungeons & Dragons. As long as the grave is reasonably fresh enough, a necromancer can have an army of zombies in literal minutes without even the chance of being detected in time. The most powerful civil engineering use of mold earth, though, certainly comes in the humble dike. We people have a strange affinity for water. It's not that strange when you consider that we need it to live. But it's a pretty universal truth that most large-scale human settlements are near a major water source, whether that be river, lake, or even a sea. 
useful for trade. The trouble with all this is flooding. Variable seasonal rainfalls make living by water a real pain. Houses, bridges and even people are swept away and major resources can often be damaged. Of course, floods can be helpful too. The ancient Egyptians survived and thrived based on seasonal floods. Their fertile plains by the Nile were fed by this exact phenomenon. But the people of D&D styled worlds have mold earth. A surefire method for creating fantastically fast five foot high flood walls across the parts of a settlement most prone and most damaged by flooding. Sure, it'll be relatively tough work, but taking material from the riverbed seems relatively reasonable, considering much of that is uh, sediment and or mud, or in other words, loose earth. With this use and the massive utility of, of clearing away the topsoil to leave a kind of level plain to build buildings on, uh, this cantrip should never fail to find a use in a regular society that lives on the surface, that is. Especially when we consider that farmers' fields are generally better classed as loose earth than particularly solid earth. Depending on how potent this spell is in your world, it is plausible that previously tilled farmland can also be turned over again in mere moments by a wielder of this cantrip. The time and energy savings on this would be remarkable, especially as this method would enable large-scale uh, vegetable farming far earlier in our developmental history than we see in our own world with the creation of the plow. We're now moving on to military applications. Dikes aren't just flood defences. One of the most significant historic structures of the 700s in Britain was Offa's Dyke, a grand multi-mile earthwork that delineated the Mercian Kingdom from the Kingdom of Powys, which would eventually come to mark much of the Welsh border. Built by Mercian King Offa by probably a hundred villages across the border doing their own bit, this great wall of earth covers 82 miles, more than half of the modern Welsh border, with a 10 foot high wall of earth, which likely provided excellent space to put up other fortifications, originally using wood and later using stone. Huge border walls like this aren't incredibly uncommon in human history, especially in Britain, uh, but it's certainly worth noting that Offa's Wall wasn't finished by the time he died in battle with the very Welsh he was trying to keep out. However, with a few cantrip casters of mold earth, it's entirely reasonable to install earthworks like this and like Hadrian's uh, famous wall, although that one used a bit more stone, it still had sections that were pure earthwork, in just one ruler's reign. Grand projects on this huge a scale become suddenly reasonable and unremarkable to some extent through just magic. Just a cantrip. Let's assume that the caster uses the spell once a minute, which is relatively slow, giving labourers time to break up the stubborn earth on a, in a ditch in one side of the earthwork. A mile of Offa's dike could be magically built up in 35.2 hours by a team of 10 labourers and a cantrip caster. It is reasonable to expect land borders to be fortified with 10 foot, 15 foot high walls of earth with ditches in front. Within a summer, if they're less than 100 miles long. Perhaps faster if you employ like large scale labourer teams and lots of casters. The serious military advantage this provides are clear and apparent. You can better police border trade, slow attacks, make smuggling, poaching and border skirmishes far less common. Too, it acts as a serious line in the sand for territorial disputes, a line over which an army cannot cross without declaring war. A physical mark on the landscape 
Lastly, let's talk castles. Again, in British history, a key development in fortification was the Mott and Bailey style castle, a formation that heavily relied on large scale earthworks. These were rough and ready fortifications, built on time and resource budgets, which had slightly raised inner courtyards and, and homesteads before a moat with a large hill of earth behind it, upon which the main keep could be built. These were among the greatest tools William the Conqueror had to control new lands fast. They'd spring up quickly in conquered towns and act as pretty potent fortification as long as the inhabitants stay loyal. Attacking uphill is incredibly energy zapping and that gets twice as hard when the same spell that built the fortification faster in fantasy also makes this climb difficult terrain, so twice as slow. I find it relatively likely that these forts may end up as excellent gifts to the mages who help in an army's advance. If you conquer your territory, use this cantrip to build a fort quickly. By the king's orders, you may be able to keep it and hold on to it throughout the generations as your land. This incentivizes magic users to join a military campaign while ensuring magic users are spread around your territory pretty broadly. With this and the ability to modify a battlefield the night before a battle starts with, with ditches, defensive earthworks and terrain, uh, Raised terrain and cover, Mold Earth is perhaps the most useful military tool for an army to have access to in D&D. And D&D militaries in general should be making regular use of Mold Earth in all sorts of army engineering on campaigns. Any army that doesn't have a, at least a dozen casters of this spell has a serious problem with battlefield control, with longevity in the field, and especially with fortifying their positions. Even a small raised mound for your archers could be game-changing in a battle, or making an artificial hill for your commander to watch from, or some great long sloped earthwork to house an entire shield wall. The fact is, the military uses of this spell Considering we have plenty of regular soldiers as labourers to help break up this dirt and turn it into loose earth, these military uses are so many and, and so varied that I can't run through or imagine them all. Please let me know if you think of any extras in your comments on the video. I'd, I'd really appreciate it. But with all that said, I've been Tom otherwise known as the Grungeon Master. Thank you so much for watching, and I will see you in the next video.